Hello, my name is Martin Mörk. I am a Deputy Ombudsman and Head of Litigation for the Swedish Equality Ombudsman. Uh, I've been asked to tell you about a case, uh, our first case on algorithmic discrimination uh, that was decided pretty much exactly 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, we didn't think of it as a case of algorithmic discrimination, uh, which I don't think was incorrect because discrimination is technique neutral uh, and uh, we didn't really think too much about it. Uh, that it happened through an algorithm. The case was against a, a large financial services provider named Western Union, which I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with. Uh, the company handles uh, quick transactions uh, across the globe. And the essence of the case is the company's efforts to implement uh, the so-called sanction lists that were uh, UN sanction lists that were taken uh, post 9-11 to prevent financial aid or transactions to certain persons named in those lists that were deemed to have links with uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, and those lists were uh, sort of implemented in the EU through a uh, particular regulation, uh, but I'm just going to refer to, to it as a sanction, sanction lists. Uh, so the key was that the financial services providers were under, ob under an obligation to ensure that uh, neither the sender nor the recipient of a financial transaction were any one of the persons named on those uh, lists. So Western Union had a system, uh, an algorithm, that sort of detected whether uh, the names of a person that uh, uh, configured in a, in a transaction uh, was a person uh, whose name matched that uh, of a name on, on, on the sanction lists. Uh, and if so, uh, the transaction uh, was blocked uh, and uh, there was a manual check. The information was sent to the US, to Western Union's security department, uh, where they contacted the, the person in question, the sender, and requested information about uh, his or her um, place of birth, uh, date of birth, uh, etc., that could enable Western Union to determine whether or not this was indeed uh, one of the uh, suspected terrorists uh, listed. Um, the problem was, of course, that these lists were uh, names that were linked to the Al-Qaeda network and the names were predominantly uh, Arab and Muslim uh, male names. Uh, and, and this system, this algorithm, uh, uh, worked in, in such a crude fashion that pretty much anyone that had a name that matched those names had their transaction blocked. And uh, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Muslim Arab naming traditions, uh, they're not a great deal of, of male names uh, if we compare, for example, to, to Western names. Uh, so a lot of the names are uh, Muhammad or derivatives of, uh, of Muhammad, Ahmed, Omar, etc. Um, so this had a, a relatively large impact. Uh, uh, I recall that Western Union at the time specified that about 0.5 of the company's transactions were blocked uh, uh, because they matched, uh, they had a match on the list. Uh, and if we're talking about a company that had millions of transactions, you can, you can figure that, that we're talking about a sizable number of persons uh, whose transactions didn't go through. Now we represented two individuals uh, who had names that matched those on the on the on the sanction lists, uh, and consequently had their transaction blocked. They were subjected to this manual checkup, had to provide information and documentation to uh, to Western Union in the U.S. Uh, and in one case, it took uh, close to three weeks to have the, the transaction cleared. Why was this? Um, uh, discrimination. Well, we claim that this was indeed indirect discrimination that uh, dis had a disparate impact on persons with Arab and Muslim names, thus linked to ethnicity. Of course, there was an intersectional aspect, but uh, we didn't have to bring that up. That was sort of appear apparent from, from the facts of the case. Um, and albeit that we, we agree that this was a justified purpose, the fight against terrorism, um, and, and compliance with uh, with EU sanction lists. Uh, 
uh, we deemed that the uh, algorithm used uh, was too crude, the filter was too crude, and it caught too many individuals uh, that uh, unnecessarily, simply. And that had the company used a less uh, or a more proportionate means uh, would have been to include other facts such as uh, date uh, and place of birth, which were facts that, uh, that were part of the sanction list uh, for most of the individuals specified there. Uh, that if they had used uh, sort of a more fine filter, uh, a great number of individuals would not have had their transaction blocked and it wouldn't have been the case in the case of the two individuals we represented either. Um, Western Union, uh, on their part, they uh, refuted that indeed the names on these lists could be uh, deemed Arabic or Muslim in nature, um, and which means that uh, under Swedish procedural law we had to provide evidence that that was the case, uh, uh, which seemed a bit ridiculous at the time, which was pretty apparent that those names were Arab or Muslim. Uh, but we had an expert that uh, uh, that uh, in, in sort of is Islamic traditions in Arabic that uh, did explain that those names were uh, came from uh, the Arab world, the Arab and Muslim world, uh, uh, a great deal of ma a majority of the names uh, came from that sphere and that indeed uh, since there were relatively few names in, in, in that sphere, male names, that this uh, algorithm would affect uh, a, a great deal of people. Um, Western Union also held that this, uh, uh, of course, was necessary to have this algorithm uh, because of compliance with the with the sanction lists, uh, and that having uh, taking up the uh, additional information of date and place of birth would uh, would uh, sort of be uh, would be against uh, data protection rules at the time uh, the underlying directive. Uh, that it would be disproportionate, uh, that you should only gather the information necessary uh, to fulfill, uh, uh, fulfill the duty. Uh, they also referred to uh, uh, e-regulation that sort of implemented this list that stated that a company that, uh, uh, that takes measures to comply with this should, should not be held liable uh, unless you could prove bad faith or negligence on, on the company's part. So it was sort of an extra hurdle, uh, not enough to prove indirect discrimination, uh, that there was also a need to establish, uh, at the time at least, that, uh, that the company had either acted in, in bad faith or, or with negligence. The court um, held in our favor. Uh, they did uh, find that indeed these uh, names were Arab and Muslim in nature and that the algorithm had uh, a disparate impact of, of persons coming with, with that background. Uh, furthermore, they did find that the algorithm was too coarse, sort of the filter used was too coarse, and that Western Union should have also uh, checked the the dates and places of birth of the persons uh, persons who were involved in the transaction, and thereby would have been a, uh, would have avoided uh, unnecessarily blocking uh, blocking transactions. And uh, for the last part, the the question of um, of negligence or, or bad faith, there was no bad faith established. That we didn't claim that either, but they did find that using such a coarse algorithm that would apparently uh, block uh, just on the basis of, uh, of similarity in names that that, would, uh, that, that was uh, indeed negligent not to have a more precise uh, algorithm. Um, what's more, the most important aspects uh, of the case, I think it's um, in some ways easier to look at the case in retrospect. Um, as I mentioned initially, this is uh, one of the first cases on algorithmic discrimination. Um, but the important part of it is that it doesn't really matter because discrimination law is uh, neutral, technique neutral, uh, and that algorithms are essentially rules, uh, just like the rules that are applied by, by us as, as lawyers and, and, uh, and humans. Um, 
and that it doesn't really matter if, if, if it's done by a computer. Um, discrimination law applies anyway. The second aspect, uh, which I think is, is important to note, is sort of a base principle when we look at things that look like ethnic profiling, um, is that when you have, when you're using uh, a two coarse filter, you catch too many uh, persons. So there is a, indeed, a sort of a duty of care to ensure that uh, you come as use as fine filter as possible to 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 not catch uh, people's uh, unnecessarily uh, simply and that you know that goes for for police checkups as well if if they have a suspect and, and how they describe that suspect if you're just using uh, an ethnic denominator you might you might caught, catch a lot of persons if you use an ethnic denominator and sex you still catch uh, a great deal of persons if you're using items of clothing like a person is wearing a red shirt, uh, you might uh, prevent from, from, from stopping everyone that, that sort of ethnically looks like the profile. Uh, and the same principle uh, applies, uh, applies here in this case, that simply it was too coarse. Everyone that had the name of uh, Mohammed Omar, which is uh, Mullah Omar's name, uh, had their transaction blocked, uh, whereas very few persons share the same place and date of birth as, as Mullah Omar. Uh, naturally, there also should be said there are also the opposite problem that when you use a, a proxy uh, that might be quite fine in nature, but that might catch a particular group, that might be problematic uh, as well from a discrimination perspective. But that's another that's another situation. And the last part, uh, which I think is slightly overlooked, uh, it is the sort of conflict of laws uh, uh, that that is somewhat addressed in the case. There is a, a, a general assumption that if you apply, if you abide by other laws, uh, that you somehow will be exempt from, uh, from discrimination law. Uh, today we have the GDPR, where, um, uh, where companies uh, make sure that their, their uh, use of data does not involve, for example, profiling, etc., and they think that they're in the clear. Um, but it's not the case because if you're using, for example, discriminatory proxies uh, or two coarse filters, uh, you may still have an issue uh, with discrimination law and you may still have to justify why the usage of that particular proxy, etc., is, is, is justified in business interest and why you cannot uh, use sort of a more proportionate or, or, or less discriminatory uh, uh, proxy or, or, or rule. Um, which is, I think, is, 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 is a little bit the, the greatest difficulty uh, when we look at these things is, is to be able to tell uh, whether or not there is a, a less a discriminatory fashion uh, way to do it. Um, naturally, one could say that the burden of proof is, is, is on the respondent, uh, but in actuality, since the respondent does have all the information, uh, you pretty much have to have a pretty good idea of how you can do things uh, otherwise uh, in order to be uh, successful. In our case that was relatively easy uh, because uh, in, in our law legislation, Swedish legislation, uh, we have uh, companies have a duty under the investigative phase, uh, so to speak, to provide the information necessary. And so we had pretty good uh, information of how this algorithm was constructed and how it how it worked. Um, uh, it was relatively simple, but I think that's a that's a main issue. Uh, so uh, make sure before you go to court that you have a good investigation uh, that that can tell you doesn't have to be in exact detail, but at least give you an idea of how things could be done differently. Thank you.